Hey everybody, welcome back to Tim Travels. It's Terry, your host. So today is the 20th of June, 623. Uh, and I am in St. Joseph, Missouri. I had a load that I delivered here this morning and it was a drop and hook, so that was cool at Tyson or I don't know, Hill, Hillshire Farms, whatever it was called. Um, so I delivered there and uh, I got an empty trailer except the reefer wouldn't turn on so I got with RA I you know I hooked it anyway and I'm like all right well you know I'm gonna see if I can get this thing fixed so I got with RA I ended up taking it down to Kansas City to get it fixed um, but some cool stuff happened along the way. One is I had a pickup at 1300 in St. Joe, which was, you know, pretty good deal, right? Basically it's a zero mile. I mean, it's not a zero mile, it's like 10 miles, but you know, it's a zero mile deadhead. And you know, then I was gonna get this load and go to Georgia. So, um, and it pays okay. Um, I wasn't really super relishing the idea of going to Georgia because it's hot as Hades down there, but you know, it is what it is. Um, it is summertime after all. Uh, so I went down to Carrier slash Transicold. I don't know what Transicold is, but I know what Carrier is. And uh, they were totally cool. This is the, um, it's actually, um, it's it's over on the west side. It's in Kansas, but um, they were totally cool. And um, they, I I had the trailer outside, and the guys like, hey, if you just have it along the side of the building, I'll send my tech out there because the bays were full. And um, guy went out there, diagnosed the problem. He said, hey, can you just turn the trailer around and disconnect? I did that, and it was fixed in about an hour and a half, and that included like. It was just, it, it ended up being a bad battery cell. And, um, and he up, you know, he updated all the software and stuff that took a little bit of time. But so I got the trailer back. I came back up here to St. Joe, got my live on load and, <coughs> excuse me. So now I'm just parked here at the Loves in St. Joe. Um, so, few things on my mind I'm not gonna really do any history today but um, so there's this sub submersible uh, I'll call it called the Titan has a, a pilot and four you know mission specialist crew people on board that each paid two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to go down in this submersible to dive on the Titanic and um, I was reading about you know it's of interest to me because I was in the Navy and um, man it I gotta tell you the um, I read I read an account from a guy who is I guess an editor uh, at the New York Times um, and he went on this sub last year I, I, I don't I think maybe the Times paid for it just to get us you know to write about it but he said it was pretty dang sketchy like some of the like you know the sub itself um some of the systems are kind of like bush league like they 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 do not they have um they basically poop in ziploc bags and pee in like a water jug or a you know like a like a, something very rudimentary and there was something else like the I can't like they they were buying stuff at like you know like equipment for this submersible at like you know Walmart and stuff and you know I talked about the thresher recently but but you know I I, I do not that I'm more of an expert than the people that have opined on this like uh, there was a retired commanding officer of a Navy sub and a few British officers talking about this but the numbers the numbers are staggering and, and 
one paper said, hey, if that sub, if there's an implosion, then what's gonna happen is from the pressure, the people's, um, it, it's gonna press all the air out of their body and then they're gonna drown within seconds. And I'm like, mm, that's not exactly how that works when you're that deep. And when I say deep, I'm talking, the, the Titanic is around 12,500 feet deep. Um, so that's like 3,800 meters. But let me throw some numbers at you if you under, so, cause I, it's always, it's always about the numbers, right? So at, at sea level, we're at one atmosphere, right? And one atmosphere exerts 14.6 pounds per square inch on our body. And every atmosphere is another, an additional 14.6, um, PSI, pounds per square inch, on the surface of our body. Now, here's the thing. If you go down 10 meters, it's basically one atmosphere. Now, 10 meters is pretty deep, right? Because 10 meters is over, it's like almost 31 feet or so. Um, well, actually, it is 31 feet. So, even people that scuba dive, that's I, I think that's fairly deep. I mean, I think they can go, maybe people are allowed to go up to 100 feet. I don't have like a civilian certification, so I don't, I don't really know. But, you know, that, the pressure starts to increase as you go down. So these guys are at, if, if they're at 12, if, if they're down there with the Titanic, and that was their goal, right? They're at 380 atmospheres. Okay, so if you do the math, that's about 5,500, actually it's 5,548 exactly, PSI at, thir at 3,800 meters. Um, so 5,550 PSI, you're not gonna drown. What's gonna happen is the pressure is basically gonna squeeze you like a frog getting run over by a car, right? It's just gonna, everything is coming out right like you're <laughs> so you're not going to drown there's going to drowning is water in your lungs that ain't going to happen um i'm and, and that's the sad part the 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 happy part is it happens in about a second um there's you know it happens about a second at that depth um so yeah that's you know, it's just not looking good for the home team. There's there's some wealthy people on there, obviously, including a man and his son. Um, so, you know, and, and people that have been down in that in submersibles, it, apparently they don't even get to the Titanic half the time because of weather, because of, you know, other conditions under sea. You know, they don't even get there. So... You know, that's a lot of money to pay to not reach your objective. But these are rich people that are have a sense of adventure, I guess. Um, anyway, so that's no bueno. A um, couple other things going on. You know, I haven't really said anything about the latest Trump indictment, but I'm going to say something. Um, just because it's it's mind-boggling like it's totally mind-boggling to me and you know I read this book one time by this attorney um, he, he was a capital defense attorney and his name is Michael Mello and I don't think he's practicing anymore but one of the more famous people that he represented was Ted Bundy and Ted Bundy famously went to about half of the first year of law school and people made a big deal of, oh, he went to law school and I guess he was maybe defending himself at first. And it's like, look, you, you know just enough to be dangerous. I mean, first, first half of the first year of law school, all you know is how to like spot issues in a tort problem, you know? I mean, you're not gonna defend yourself against murder charges in a jurisdiction that has capital punishment, right? And Michael Mello tells this story where Ted Bundy would just run his mouth, right? Now, here's the thing. Ted Bundy didn't care if he was convicted, really. 
And I think there's some evidence that Ted Bundy actually wanted to be executed, right? He loved that attention. Um, but one time, Michael Me Mello in his book says, one time, I just finally, I just said to Ted Bundy, I'm like, will you just shut the fuck up, right? You're, you're making my job harder. And, you know, I don't necessarily want to compare Trump to Ted Bundy, but let's compare Trump to Ted Bundy. I'm sure Bundy made his attorney's jobs a tiny bit harder, right? Trump is making his attorney's jobs damn near impossible. Because, and, and let me say this about federal investigations. I've had clients or people that I worked with um, indicted, tried, tried a second time, and then found guilty and imprisoned in federal prison. Um, you know, these guys initially got sentences to like 12 years, and this was white collar crime, you know. Um, but, you know, when the, fed, when the feds decide somebody's gonna get indicted, they usually know that they can make their case. It's pretty rare that the feds lose at trial. It's pretty rare. Um, and here's the thing. Donald Trump has basically admitted to at least obstruction of justice. Like he's just running his freaking pie trap. And by the way, um, the lady that sued him, Jean Carroll, or E. Jean Carroll, I think her name is, the one that won the the civil lawsuit against him for defamation she she's reopening her case even because after he lost he basically was told by a court of law hey um you need to shut the f up he went that night on national tv and ran his mouth again and she's reopening the case based on this that interview thing he had on CNN. It's like, I don't know if he's, if he's just like mentally ill or he just thinks that he's untouchable, which would also kind of make you think he's mentally ill, right? I mean, this is not a joke. Do I think Trump will do time in prison? I mean, there's a good chance of it right? Not in the civil case. And I'm not even sure the criminal case in Manhattan has that much to it. Um, I don't know what they're going to present in Georgia, although it won't, I will not be shocked if he gets indicted in Georgia. But on this federal case, I mean, only people that are snorting the Trump crack think that this isn't a serious, serious problem. He's admitted, like, over and over and over again, in public, on, you know, recorded, that he had classified information and he gets to have it. That's just false. Like, he's got lawyers. I, I don't even get it, and I'm just kind of going on a rant here. But it's like, I, and by the way, I think that the reason there are so many people in the Republican presidential primary or in race is because they all know Trump is going to jail, right? Chris Christie was the U.S. attorney for the District of New Jersey. He put Jared Kushner's dad, he put Trump's in-law in prison. Asa Hutchinson, who was the governor of Arkansas, I'm pretty sure he is a lawyer. He, you know, has not supported Trump. DeSantis, who went to law school, he he can't figure out what the hell he's doing. He just knows he hates, you know, gay Mickey Mouse or whatever. Um, you know, that's why he's running. Like, all these people are throwing their hats in a ring because, honestly... No one thinks, no one who knows the law thinks Trump is going to be around for the Republican convention. Now, you know, there could be appeals, there could be, you know, but I, I think he's already convicted. I think it's just a matter of time, you know, and this judge, you know, 
And, and by the way, let me say this about the judge. This judge has already been smacked down by the 11th Circuit on a pretrial motion. She's, you know, everybody's like, oh, she's in the tank for Trump. I mean, she might be a serious Trump acolyte, but at some point, um, no federal judge wants to be hated, hated by other federal judges. And when the 11th Circuit is smacking you down, you're being smacked down by one of the most conservative circuits in the country, okay? This is not the 9th Circuit or the 2nd Circuit or the 3rd Circuit smacking her down. It's the 11th Circuit, you know? So, I, I, just, think, I just think Trump is is toast. It's just a matter of time. Um, you know, and the trial date's set for August. So I don't know that that's going to hold up. That seems really quick, but, um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me that we get to trial by the end of the year. So that's that. Um, and speaking of jackasses, um, you know, I was talking about Juneteenth yesterday, started down in Texas, but apparently the governor of Texas still thinks that working people half to death in the heat is okay. You know, nor, nothing surprises me anymore. Nothing that any politician does really surprises me. But like, the governor of Texas signed a law basically voiding the city ordinances in Dallas and San Antonio that say if you have a construction worker, um, you have to give them extra breaks, water breaks, like 10 minutes every four hours. And, you know, the governor is like, no, we can't have that kind of liberal bullshit keeping people from heat stroke. And, you know, and I'm just like, how, how cruel of a pile of horse crap do you have to be to really hate people that much? Like, you know, and, and he relate heat related death is the number one cause of number one weather related death in America by a long shot. Way more than hurricanes, tornadoes, heat related death. And it's it, it is just I mean, I would just, I wish the governor of Texas would just, on the state house or his governor's mansion, just put a giant ass lighted sign that says, if you're not white and rich, I don't give a fuck about you, right? I don't care if you die in the heat because you're trying to work and put food on the table for your family. And, you know, I, I, I just don't even get it, right? Like, Texas is booming. Why wouldn't you want people to not die on the construction site or paving a road or doing something? It's just, you know, it's just no excuse. So let me talk about advocating for yourself since I, I maybe sounded like I was advocating for, sorry, um, for construction workers in Texas. Um, by the way, it was just Dallas and San Antonio. I mean, my gosh. Um, so I finished my lease on my freight liner. And at the end of my lease, and, and, and this is important, right? You have to, if you're in business, right? There's a saying in business, if you don't ask, you don't get. You have to be mercenary. You have to squeeze people for every penny that you're owed and for every penny that you want. Even if you're not owed something, still think like, I mean, I don't wanna say Trump, cause he's, he's a crap businessman actually, but think like you were John Gotti, right? Like when somebody gives you 80%, tell them they're, they're screwing you over and you want your other 10% of what they have, right? S you know, be, be mercenary, you know, 
And you know, one time I said to this car dealer, I, he was like, oh, we're giving you our best price. I said, look, man, I said, it's not, it, you might think it's your best price, but I'm not gonna buy this car. I said, they go, well, we gotta make a buck. I said, when I leave this dealership, I want you to hate me. I want, I want to leave here with such a good deal that you hope you never see me again and you have to work extra hard to get the money that you lost on me out of somebody else, right? And um, I don't know if that lesson worked because one time my daughter made a killer deal on a car so good that the dealership called me complaining. I was like, that's my girl, right? I was so proud of her. <laughs> I just love that story. And this was a used car dealership. It was, it was, oh, it was beautiful. Anyway, so you got to advocate for yourself. No one's going to advocate for you. It's your money, right? So end of lease bonus, right? And you know, other people have talked about the end of lease process. Freight skater will. He, does, he has a couple videos, great job on those. You should check out his channel if you haven't. Um, you know, and, and you know, I just kind of ask around and stuff. But, but here's the thing, and, and Will gives good advice on material condition of the truck, you know. It was kind of funny, because I got the report for my truck, and oh my gosh, they were miracle workers if what they said on my maintenance report was true about um, the condition that Freightliner was in when the person before me turned it in. Apparently they had a pet and they never, ever cleaned up after it. Like they didn't clean up after its mess, they didn't clean up its fur. They 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 were disgusted by the truck and they they said they needed 16 hours to detail that truck. So I turned my truck in as clean as possible, except I wasn't able to, like I, I cleaned the floors, but I wasn't able to completely vacuum because the vacuums were hidden behind a trailer there at Springfield. Um, but anyway, I had, so I had some body damage from both hitting a deer recently, like a week before I turned my truck in, and then I also had an incident that I've never really talked about because, uh, you know, I'm candidly a little embarrassed about it. Um, I could have done better, and you know, I didn't get I didn't get a ticket. I didn't get any CSA points. I didn't, you know, hurt anybody. But what happened, and this happened last year in August, it was pouring down rain. I was on I-80 in Pennsylvania. And again, this is the first time I'm talking, to, there's a few people that know about this. Pouring down rain at night, going downhill. Um, and, and you know, it's one of those deals where I was just taking a load, the last load uh, before home time. And I always, I, I always tell my trainees, hey, and, and I always tell myself, right, stay out of the scrum. And if you don't know what a scrum is, it's that pile in, in rugby where all, every player on the, on the pitch, with a couple of exceptions, is just like pushing each other and stuff. And, you know, it's just like, it, it, it's, it, it's like they're smashing into each other and just trying to drive each other back. Uh, you know, cross over the ball, basically. And I always say, stay out of the scrum. And you know what the scrum looks like, right? It's like you're driving along 60, 65, and then all of a sudden you see like six cars and seven semis all in a group, and they, they all look like they're at the Daytona 500, right? They're jockeying for position. They're right up each other's butts. They're cutting each other off. And they and they have to go around you. You're like the lapped car on the track, right? And um, they finally get around you, and then they reassemble and they get back in their formation. But there's all sorts of you know stuff going on. That's the scrum. That's what I mean by the scrum. And I always tell myself, hey, stay out of the scrum. But on this particular night, even though I didn't feel good about this and by the way when your gut tells you something's not right it's probably not right I didn't feel great about this but I was like I just want to get this load delivered so I'm following a truck 
and there were two other trucks, some cars, a couple pickup trucks with trailers. It's about nine o'clock at night. It's pouring down rain. I, I'm behind this guy that has an empty, like, it's a semi, but he has one of those empty trailers because he transports um, pop-up campers. And then there's this other dude with a rattle ass Volvo and a rented trailer. And he's in front of this guy, but then he goes into the right hand lane. Well, we're going down this hill and I'm candidly too close to the guy in front of me. And what happens next is, and this has been a fear of mine and it kind of came true. Some other chucklehead in a Volvo, and I have pictures of this, I'm not gonna show them, but I do have pictures of this truck too. Um, some other guy in a Volvo managed to run, managed to um, jackknife and run his trailer and the trailer wheels up over a guardrail and flip himself onto the driver's side of the truck. So, and block, the shoulder and the right lane, okay? But mind you, it's pitch black, It's we're up in the sticks in PA, and we're coming downhill, and it's pouring down rain. So the dude in the rattle trap Volvo that had moved over into the right lane, all of a sudden, he sees with his headlights, um, a trailer on its side in front of him, or actually the tractor probably because mostly the tractor was in the that lane and anyway he immediately swerves left clips the the guy in front of me hits him and the guy in front of me starts to jackknife his trailer's empty so what do I do I drive down in the median and when I drove down in the median um, the corner of his trailer sliced open the back part of my trailer but the other thing that happened is um, I messed up the steering on my truck but I also like tore up the little um, plastic things at the very bottom you know and I, I cracked the bottoms of the fenders and stuff so anyway that was that but all that body damage I mean I had the steering fixed but all that body damage at the bottom was still on my truck I just never got done but there was an insurance claim yada yada so I have two insurance claims. So, so that was a long story, but I apologize. But anyway, so at the end of my lease, I had thirteen thousand six hundred and twenty-three dollars, thirteen six twenty-three in my end of lease bonus, and I was in the hole on the tire fund because I had, I just was four hundred and five dollars. Not a big deal. Um, but then when I got the you know tally. They're like, congratulations, you're getting back $3,845. I'm like, whoa, um, that sounds a little low, right? So I, I looked at, so then when I got that email and phone call, then that's when I finally got the sheet. And I went through the body shop and the tractor shop reports, and they both were saying there was about $4,000 worth of things that needed to be done to my truck. And I said, and what killed me is on the body shop, every single picture they took was of that damage that I just described at the bottom of the truck from, you know, kind of bouncing around in the median. And by the way, I didn't flip over anything. They just winched me out. And then, you know, I actually drove, I actually drove my tractor to a shop about 10 miles away, but it was like going down the road sideways. I probably shouldn't have even driven it, but I did. And then anyway, um, so I, so I was like, what the hell? And I was pretty angry because I, I had asked the guy at the, at the inspection bay, I'm like, hey, 
I have these claim numbers. I had all my ducks in a row, right? I knew the claim numbers, all that information. I said, do you want that? And he's like, oh no, they'll have that information. They'll just net it all out and it, you know, it'll all be good. I'm like, okay, cool. So, um, I don't know what I need to do here. Sorry. So, so when I saw this, I was like, man, they didn't do anything. It's like, it, it, it's like if I don't pitch a fit, they're going to rip me off. And I even said this in my reply email. I, w I, I went on for like four paragraphs, right? And, and I was like, you know, I wonder how many millions of dollars prime lessees have left on the table because you guys won't even like be straight shooters. So then she, this lady emailed me back. She was very nice. She was in leasing and she's like, hey, um, let's talk when you get a chance, right? So I call her up when I get back from my little mini vacation and I, you know, I'm like, look, I had all this stuff is covered. And then like there was stuff like broken fog light, bent deer guard, uh, damage to the inside of the left fender, you know, on the tractor shop report. I'm like, all that's covered by these claims. You guys took the thousand bucks from me like a microsecond after I reported those incidents, you know? And I, I, and I was like, you know, this is just bullshit. I said, I expected more professionalism and you know how I feel about professionalism. And so I, I was nice on the phone and she was like, wow. She said, man, when I saw your email, I was like, this guy thinks I don't do my job. Well, it turns out that she had none of the claim information. She didn't have the pictures because I had sent pictures of the damage, um, you know, right away to RA. And so what ended up happening is, remember I told you, they said, oh, you're getting $3,845 back. Well, it, just in that phone call, she was like, I will give you credit for another $4,957. So more than the original amount, like I more than doubled it by having information on two insurance claims and pitching a fit basically. So, you know, I netted out from this 13623, 8802. Now, I was, I was thinking if I got to around 50%, I would be happy because, you know, I knew that I had a minor, you know, I had some minor issues with you know, it's just wear and tear, right? Like, like I think I had a, a small leak in my um, coolant, you know, just a lot of little things, right? Um, maybe there's some other stuff that needs to be done. So my message is this, right? Keep good records. You know, I made sure I knew those insurance claim numbers. I made sure that I didn't just let it slide. A lot of people would say, Oh, you know that 3845 bucks, man, that's just found money. But here's the thing, it's not really found money. If you're leasing a prime, they're holding money back from you every single week for tire fund and for that end of lease bonus, right? So it is my money. Now, you know, was I starving because I wasn't getting that 13623 over the course of the lease? No, I was still making good money. But but this is a bonus. But keep in mind the term bonus is really, you know, kind of misleading. Bonus makes it sound like somebody gives you something more than you were going to get. Well, I got more than I was going to get, but the money for the bonus came from me, right? I paid my own bonus. So don't forget that. Don't forget that every single cent, right, that you make, somebody's going to have their hand out saying, oh, pay us, pay this, pay that, okay? That's on top of the 28% that we agree to give to Prime for a lot of the stuff they do, right? But 
I'm okay with the 28%, but everything beyond that, I don't want them taken, okay? And the other thing about being mercenary is, remember I just told you that I had to take this trailer down and get it fixed? That trip was about 100 miles round trip. And I know that I'm gonna get paid for that. The reason I know is because my fleet manager asked for the code for the repair shop. Every single place you ever get sent at Prime, they got a code for. Make sure, don't do anybody favors. I know like, you know, I've said, oh, I hooked up somebody when I repowered a load or I took a load that somebody else couldn't handle and it was a, you know, I did my video how I saved the company. But don't do anything because you're nice. You're not running a charity and man, fight for every penny. If you wanna spend money, you know, your own money by going fast, for example, that's your business, right? Like, if you say, oh, I always wanna drive 65, even when I can drive 62 or 60, that's okay, because you're making the decision. But don't let anybody make the decision to take your money without you fighting back. If there's a reason you should be getting more, you always gotta advocate for yourself. So, and you know, that's why understanding what's in your lease, understanding what prime or success are entitled to, you know, cause if you understand what they're entitled to, you understand what you're entitled to. And you know, honestly, when I went into this negotiation, if you wanna call it that, um, I was like, well, if they don't want to recognize these insurance claims, then I at least want the deductibles back. I want two grand back. So my goal going into that call was to get at least two grand. And I got 49, what did I say, 49.57. Um, and by the way, I, you know, once I presented all this, she gave me the numbers and really wasn't, I, I you know, when I heard the numbers she was giving me back on the different, from the different, shop, you know, estimates, I knew that she was being fair with me, right? Because I was getting back more than I had really hoped for. So anyway, um, you know, keep all that in mind whenever you're dealing with with Prime. Because everybody that works in the, in the big house, you know, in Springfield, their job.